Welcome to the Global Connection, a Tel Aviv University podcast. Journey with us as we discover how TAU's academic community and friends are engaging with and helping to shape this ever-changing world. Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Sajeki. I am the host of the Global Connection podcast. I am honored to welcome today Dan Rabinowitz, a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University. While Dan's earlier academic work focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, his more recent academic attention is on global warming, specifically in relation to the Middle East. He is a former head of TAU's School of Environmental Studies program and is the current head of a new graduate program focused on climate change. At different points in his career, he has also been the president of the Israeli Anthropological Association, chairman of Greenpeace Mediterranean, and is currently the chair of the Israeli Association for Environmental Justice. That is quite the CV. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Anna. Thanks for having me. You, um, I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, you know, one, one reason being climate change is something that is always on my mind, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can. And so it's always very exciting to have an expert before me. Um, but I, I think I'd like to start the conversation by going back a little bit. Um, so I've read that you spent four years in an ecological study center in the Sinai. So was that really where this lifelong affinity, respect for the environment began for you? I think so. I was um, 21 at the time, just um, immediately after my release from the IDF. Mm -hmm. Uh, interested in general in hikes and the environment and ecology, but these were early days for these disciplines. We're talking um, late uh, or middle 1970s, so that's uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and there we were, a group of 15 or 20 young Israelis interested in nature, mm -hmm perched on a bold mountain in the middle of Sinai mm -hmm. when there wasn't even a paved road to mm -hmm. go there. So we were 220 kilometers from the nearest uh, paved road. Um, left for our own devices of exploring and understanding nature and the different connections between its elements. Okay. Frequented by um, groups of hikers whom we would take on sort of hiking ex expeditions into the mountains for formative years for me and for, for the others, some of whom became famous professors at Israeli and other univers universities and have done, have done sort of long, lifelong work with conversation, conservation. Okay, okay. Um, what I find interesting then is that when you did your doctorate, you did it in social anthropology. So as someone who is not an expert in social anthropology, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it feels like a bit of a different trajectory from, from those four years in the Sinai. Um, so what, what brought you to social anthropology? The Jibalia tribe, a Bedouin tribe, okay. um, who were our neighbors, or it would be more correct to say that we became their neighbors after the 1967 occupation by Israel of the Sinai. Okay. And this is a very special tribe uh, with, with a long tradition of a special connection with the monks at Santa Catarina Monastery, which was around the corner from where we lived and where the Bedouins live. And um, this fascination and, and, uh, with, with their culture but also the personal contacts that were forged between us, the young members of this field study center run by the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel in the middle of Sinai and the Bedouin uh, from this very ancient tribe who were interested in us as much as we were interested in them. And that's where my interest in social anthropology was kindled. Mm -hmm. I was also very uh, fortunate to to be associated at the time, even before I became a student in any university, <clears throat> with Professor Emmanuel Marx, who was the leading anthropologist here at Tel Aviv University, and who sort of took an interest 
in what we were doing out there in the desert <clears throat> and offered his services as a mentor and, and, and a guide, really, for me doing my first steps in ethnographic fieldwork. Mm -hmm. So building on that, um, after a few years in the Sinai in, the, in, in 1979, actually after the Sinai was given back, or part, that part of Sinai was given back to Egypt, I went to England, started doing environmental work at university. I did a uh, human environmental studies BSc okay. at King's College, but uh, very soon after that, about a year or a year and a half into my university education, I sort of switched and became an intercollegiate student with LSE across the street where I took social anthropology, which then developed into my more sort of permanent interest in this. I went to Cambridge to do an MPhil and then a PhD. But yes, I think that the roots for all of that was in, the, in those four formidable years in the Sinai. Okay. Okay. So it's much more closely connected than I thought it might be. I have done, um, as someone who's quite new here, I'm trying to do as much reading on Israel and understanding it as much as possible. So I have dug into a bit of your work on uh, basically um, eth ethnographic study of Palestinians here in relation to living with Israelis, the history, the present. Um, so I do very much see your work uh, a real rootedness in place and in environment. Um, so, yes, uh, well, it's it's always a pleasure to you know to have a conversation with someone who who knows your work, um, and I think that you 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 by by using the word place, I think you capture a, a part of it which is really very important and dear to me, and that. Most of my work, whether it was in the environmental field or in the cultural, social anthropology field, has really been about people in, in their place mm -hmm. and, and, and the very intricate connections, only some of which I, I feel that even now I understand between people and the terrain where they live and how culture weaves into it. Still a mystery to me after all those years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, well, it feels like a mystery to me, but at the same time, you know, if we think about your more recent work on global warming in relation to the Middle East, it feels like we kind of have to know a little bit at this point. Um, the stakes are higher. So at, at what point in your career did you realize that you really wanted to focus on climate change in, in your academic work? I think it was um, around the turn of the century when um, data and concepts and insights into what is happening in the atmosphere was beginning to seep down and trickle down also into the social sciences and the humanities. It was early days. I mean, most of the work that was done on, that was being done on climate change in the 1990s was still done by biological science and geophysics and people interested in the atmosphere, uh, chemistry and physics of, of what's happening up in heavens. Mm -hmm. um, but by that time, it was becoming obvious through the projections and the models that people were producing about what the future might bring, that this is a fundamentally a social issue and a political issue, something that spans economy, economics and politics and morality uh, because it touches on inequalities. Mm -hmm. And within this sort of emerging worrying picture of the, of the future, the Middle East sort of really was glowing there in a good sense and in a bad sense as a hotspot Mm -hmm. where current temperatures are already amongst the highest in the world, but also where projections <clears throat> are more extreme than they are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If in most places we are anticipating um, an increase in temperatures during the 21st century of one and a half, two, two and a half degrees centigrade, the Middle East is signaling maybe double that in mm -hmm. some sp spots, not all, not, not throughout the, the region. 
So um, given that and given other attributes of the Middle East as a not particularly stable place, and of course later the whole debate about post-oil, all of these make this the, the Middle East a, a, a fascinating theater of, mm. of research operation when it comes to climate. And if you don't mind me saying, your your most recent book, The Power of Deserts, uh, Climate Change in the Middle East and the Promise of a po- Post-Oil Era, um, I think really captures some of that expansiveness that you were referring to, um, that, you know, especially in this region, there are so many elements to consider, um, some contradictions as well to work out. Um, so tell me, tell me about coming to that spot where you were ready to write this book. I, you know, like 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 many projects that we do in a, in academia, <clears throat> in hindsight, it almost looks inevitable, and it almost looks like this project sort of was begging someone to pick it up, and I happened to be there. Um, I think it's the realizations around um, COVID and what was happening to oil and its demand during COVID, which was very paradoxic and very strange, Mm -hmm. uh, that really focused my attention on what became eventually the main argument of the book, which is sort of a counterintuitive idea that it's the biggest and most aggressive oil producers of the world, the countries around the, the, the per- Persian or Arabian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, um, who might eventually be pushed to do something that now looks really far-fetched, and that is to turn themselves into hubs of solar energy. Uh, and it is counterproductive because these are countries that for the last 70 years have prospered immensely uh, from ex- uh, exporting, producing, exporting, and, and, and burning uh, uh, fossil fuels, mainly oil and natural gas, all around the world. So uh, the notion that something is happening not only to the climate of the Middle East, but also to the future of oil was a realization which around 2018, 19, and then 2020 with COVID sort of presented itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, so it is a very counterintuitive uh, argument, especially for, for me, I'm coming from North America. And so I would say that my, my understanding um, or the way that I've read the, the Gulf nations in relation to oil is a very North American one, which... Um, you know, it, it, I'm not saying that it's correct, but it hasn't been on the side of progress in terms of environmentalism. Um, and, and so for me, it, it's a really, really exciting argument to see this. And um, I, I feel like in climate change studies, there isn't a lot of hope to hold on to. So was that important to you to, to end the book on a um, you know, on, on with with hope, uh, it, it was important, and it was sort of a revelation. I had, uh, I've been determined to to do something about climate change in the Middle East even before that, sort of by 2015, 2016, and then work was going on, <clears throat> and then the whole idea of post oil sort of presented itself. Let me just walk. Uh, the, the listeners through the main argument in Absolutely. a more orderly that w- way. That would be wonderful. And that would really sort of contextualize uh, this this, argu- this, this uh, exchange between us. So the idea is that the Middle East is facing double trouble. On the one hand, and especially the Gulf states, they are the hottest spots in the Middle East and in the world already. And post-normal climate is going to be horrendous for them to the extent that recent studies suggest that by 2060, 2070, some of the mega cities of the Gulf, where trillions have been invested in these new, ultra modern, mega advanced hubs, 
like Kuwait City and like Dubai and Abu Dhabi and others, might be in, in inhabitable. People will not be able to live there as they do today and maybe not at all. Um, areas that are already experiencing daily highs of 45 to 50 in the summer for three consecutive months might be five or six degrees hotter. That means daily highs of above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, above 50 centigrade for three months. Think about people who have to do construction work or maintenance uh, of any installation and civil infrastructure. And, and other people who just want to be occasionally outdoors um, for three or four months. Um, so, so that costs a, a major shadow on the future of, of this area. This, the post-normal climate for them might be an existential problem, not just an inconvenience. And that is after we factor in the fact that they are very, very rich and they could use technology and import technology and really transform some of their public spaces and, of course, private spaces to be... Um, to be more hospitable even in, in extreme temperatures. So that's one thing. The other thing is that oil's future doesn't look as promising as its recent past. 50% um, of oil is used in transportation, and we know where transportation is already going. 30% globally in some, in some countries is already electric. And by 2030 most of the developed world will have passed legislation that prohibits the sale of gasoline, petrol um, engines for cars. So we're going electric, mm -hmm. but also in power production, in electricity, where natural gas, a major export for the Gulf states, is in now reigns supreme, but which in 30 or 40 years time would probably be predominantly fired by alternative energy and renewable energy, mainly solar and turbine. So if you cast a shadow also on the future of oil, then the problem of what the future might look like economically and politically in an area like the Gulf emerges as an extremely urgent issue. So I think this is this is where my thinking about it this started. And then it was also um, buttressed by the realization of the leaderships in the Gulf area, which has been manifest since 20 years at least, that they are over-dependent on oil mm -hmm. and natural gas and that their economies should be diversified. And in all of the blueprints and visions that they've been re regularly producing, official documents for the last 20 years, you see energy diversification as a major component. Now, have they done much about it in the last 20 years? Not really. The United Arab Emirates is the most effective of the six, and but, but even they are only at about 7 or 8% of their electricity being produced from solar energy. Okay. But nevertheless, the kernels are there. Mm -hmm. So that sort of got me thinking about what might the future bring. Okay, okay. You know, it, it really is such an interesting area from the, the perspective of climate change. And like you mentioned, it's almost like we're at this tipping point, especially right here. Um, and, and one can hope that we... We go in a new direction. Um, from my understanding, the, the new master's program in climate change is the first program in the Middle East, uh, first graduate program in the Middle East dedicated to climate change. Uh, even, even more than the Middle East. Even um, more, okay. Uh, I mean, there are a few dozen pro master's programs around the world, in the English-speaking world, which have climate as part of their the program's name and and part of the degree. However, um, eighty or ninety percent of them are in the natural sciences or biological sciences or engineering or atmospheric science. 
um, fields of academia. Okay. Extremely important. Mm -hmm. I hope that Tel Aviv University itself will soon have a master's program in the, in the Jewish physics area uh, that, that focuses on, on, on climate change, climate predictions. But only a handful of these global programs, master's programs, are in the social sciences. So we here at Tel Aviv University, by uh, initiating this um, this program, which we, we, we will in, inaugurate in October 23, mm -hmm. we join a very, very small club okay. of u universities. Uh, Columbia University in New York has a program since 2008 called, called Climate and Society. Um, <clears throat> SOAS and other elements of London University have them. There was one or two programs in Australia, but otherwise a very small amount of a master's degree in the social sciences which focus on, on climate. And, 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 and as you say, none of them sort of east of London and west of Melbourne. All right. So, pretty, that's a pretty big geography, if I'm <laughs> if I'm remembering the the globe correctly. It, it is, and and it's significant that we are actually getting a lot of interest from people both within the space, mm -hmm. you know, Asia and Africa, mm -hmm. but also from North America okay. and Europe. So we are hoping to inaugurate this program in in October with a very diverse and sort of lively uh, group of maybe 15 or 20 or 30 young people. Um, we see this program as serving two main goals. One is to enhance research, social science research in into global warming and into climate change. This is something that has been going on. We are not completely on our own here. There's been a surge of social science work on climate change for the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's still room for many more programs who would be able to usher in a new generation of young scientists, you know, men and women who are really seeing a future in social science research into climate. That's one goal. The other goal is to, um, to help create a new cohort of professionals which are badly needed, uh, who are badly needed in in many walks uh, and, 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 and parts of the, of the labor market, uh, we see now that government, both national governments and local governments, are preoccupied with climate change on a variety, on a variety of levels. Policy, planning, physical planning, um, social and political uh, types of, of policy, uh, Taxation, mm -hmm. carbon taxation, you know, disguised in, in many ways because not many governments like to use the word uh, uh, um, climate taxation, but, right. but, but they're thinking about it. So in government, um, in civil society, mm -hmm. many organizations, but now also in finance and industry mm -hmm. uh, because new standards are, are being imp implemented by governments all around the world that have to do with reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And if you are an industrial organization or a financial organization which invests in industry, you must be able to gauge the carbon performance of either yourself if you're in industry or those you invest in if you're in finance. Mm -hmm. And that means employing people in-house who can look either at your own operation or at other a company's operation through the prism of, of greenhouse gas emissions and the climate. Mm -hmm. So there's a vast uh, array of jobs and professional opportunities which are looking for people to fulfill them. And we are absolutely convinced that people who would have a master's degree in climate, in our case it's the social and policy aspects of climate change, will have a huge advantage. Uh, and that is true really universally mm -hmm. uh, across the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I understand too that the program is offered in English and that there's a bit of a hands-on compo component. Yes. Um, we think that for, both for uh, 
young Israelis who want to have a foothold in, a, in an area which is, by definition, a global area. Mm-hmm. S- studying English in English would be good. But also for many others who would come to Tel Aviv, especially from abroad, um, and we, we want this program to be open for them. Uh, unfortunately, there are not more than seven or eight million Hebrew speakers around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, 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 and of course, we are, we are casting our net wider to be attractive for people from all around the world. Um, and yes, this is the main reason why we want it to be in English. And, uh, and also, this is one of the main reasons why we have made a point of actually having some very senior policy makers uh, as, as, they, as, in, as instructors. Fortunately, we have um, Professor Alon Tal, who is professor at the uh, School of uh, Department of Pu- Public Policy here in Tel Aviv and one of the leading environmental activists uh, in Israel uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, who also served as a member of Knesset um, for Yesh uh, for the last few years and has amassed a lot of um, experience in this field. And another person is, is Dr. Dov Hanin, who was a member of the Israeli Knesset for eight years, was head of the subcommittee for the environment, and is really uh, seen by, uh, by many as one of the leading intellect- public intellectuals uh, and policymaker involved with climate change. He's now the head of the uh, President of Israel's Forum on Climate Change, which is a very active and very vibrant sort of collection of, of excellent minds um, from science, from policy, from the NGO world who are trying to put their minds together and, and tackle it. So between Dov Henin and, and, uh, and Alon Tal, um, we are really offering people a, a, a vast cachet of, of experience in climate policy, which I know young people are looking for in a, in a, in a, in a pro- program of study as much as they are looking for sort of intellectual and research energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I myself worked in government for a little while and uh, related to the circular economy. And, you know, when you're doing that type of work, you're you're looking to the world and there's so much information out there. Um, So trying to navigate that and um, and look to examples that are applicable, um, looking to, you know, changing behavior of people is such a big component and, you know, it, so, so I completely see where you're coming from in terms of the interdisciplinary element that's needed um, to really tackle this issue. You're absolutely right. And I think that your experience sort of from the other side of this prism is, is, is extremely relevant. Uh, this is why we take very seriously in this new master's program, uh, social and policy aspects of climate change, we take very seriously a practicum seminar, mm-hmm. which will basically run throughout the year. By the way, this uh, master's program is, 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 can be completed in, in 12 months, okay. in, in three, three semesters, fall, spring, and, and a short summer, summer semester. But throughout the year, we will run a practicum seminar where students will be inserted individually into t- different types of organizations and institutions. It can be local government, national government, in the Israeli Knesset, and the legislature, um, in financial organizations, in industry, in NGOs, and they will be interns in those organizations for a few hours every week, uh, study that organization's performance when it comes to climate change and eventually write a sort of a, cres- a cross-section report on this activity, which we're hoping will, will really give them exactly what you, you're talking about, mm-hmm. this perspective of trying to do something about climate uh, in an institutional framework mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and doing it in a world which keeps changing, where information flows are incessant and where the sense of urgency um, is is really ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. 
So I feel like you may have your hands full a little bit launching a new program. Uh, but I have to ask, are you working on any new research? Yes, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm working on a, on a book um, on carbon. Okay. And more specifically on CO2, on carbon dioxide. I'm doing sort of a social science history of CO2 um, and how it's really been a... Um, a, a main theme and a connecting a connecting thread um, through the main stages of modernization and development. Um, the industrial revolution was a mechanical a mechanization re revolution. It mm -hmm. created a thirst for energy and dependency on fossil fuels. It also created major um, prosperity and raised standards of living, but it had an unintended consequences of high amounts of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and, uh, and, and climate change as a result. Now, going through these four or five stages of modernity, which is uh, a revolution, mechanization, energy dependency, emissions, climate change, and its solutions... But doing it through the prism of CO2 okay. is, is something that I'm excited about. Okay. And it's a, it's a book that has already been commissioned by the Van Leer Jerusalem Fund Foundation and will come as part of the Global Objects uh, series okay. that they have there. Okay. Um, so yes, CO2 as a global object is something that is very much on my mind. Well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to reading it when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for taking the time to, to talk with me today, Professor Rabinovitz. Thank you, Anna. Glad to be here.